Good morning and welcome to worship here at Mount Olivet United Methodist Church. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Ware. I am honored to serve as the pastor of Wesley Chapel and Rock Springs United Methodist Churches. And I am honored and privileged to be here worshiping with you here at Mount Olivet this morning. We have a fantastic worship service planned um, for you this morning. Pastor Tim and I have been working together on an Advent lectionary based sermon series. So we work on our sermons together. We plan the worship services together. So we, Tim really has put a hand in this. I know he misses you all while he is on vacation. He said to tell you all hello and that he is looking forward to being back in worship with you next week. As we settle into worship, I invite you to settle in, to take a deep breath, to exhale. As we set our minds and hearts on God as we have our prelude and the light of Christ is brought in. Thank you, Mike. I invite you to join with me in our call to worship. Oh, that God would tear open the heavens and come down. Be alert. Keep awake. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. 
As we continue to worship this Son of God, I invite you to join with us. Those of you who are worshiping with us online, we invite you to sing aloud. Those of us who are gathered here in the sanctuary will meditate on the song in our hearts and perhaps hum along to Shine, Jesus, Shine. part of our Advent time together, we're going to be using the beginning of worship as a time of confessing our sins. We'll repeat this pattern of confessing, of calling to confessing, of confessing, and then being assured of our pardon throughout this Advent season. Hear now this call to confession. Like a faded dry leaf that the wind blows away, our sins dry us up, faded and brittle, We are carried off by the wrongs we have done. Yet God loves us still and is able to restore and renew us with the water of life. Won't you join with me as we pray together our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we become distracted, even weary in our discipleship. We keep busy schedules. We rush about. Captivated by technology, seduced by the lure of consumer goods, we do not remain alert to your divine presence in our lives, in the church, in the world. Make us better doorkeepers of our lives, watching for you attentively. Awaken us to your surprising power and glory and peace, so we do not miss how near you are to our very own gates. Be gracious towards us, we pray, until we are gathered from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven into your embrace. We pray this in the name of Christ, who was and is and is to come. Amen. The grace of God given to us in Jesus Christ strengthens us to the end so that we may be blameless when Christ comes again. Thanks be to God who is faithful and has called us into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite Glenn and Ruth to come forward as we have our Advent candle lighting liturgy. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right, 
Nothing seems like it used to be nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, Oh, that you would hear, would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known so that nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O oh Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope, hope that you can meet us even in the mess of our world, hope that you will see, still see us though we feel we are lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Won't you join with me in our prayer for illumination? Gracious God, heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will not pass away. Your word stands forever. May our generation be attentive so that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we remember your ways and gladly do right, meeting you wherever and whenever you appear. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. Hear now the word of the Lord. In those days, after the suffering of that time, the sun will become dark and the moon won't give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the planets and other heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then they will see the human one coming in the clouds with great power and splendor. Then he will send the angels and gather together his chosen people from the four corners of the earth, from the end of the earth to the end of heaven. Learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that he's near at the door. I assure you that this generation won't pass away until all these things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. But nobody knows when that day or hour will come, not the angels in heaven and not the Son. Only the Father knows. Watch out. Stay alert. You don't know when the time is coming. It is as if someone took a trip, left the household behind, and put the servants in charge, giving each one a job to do, and told the doorkeeper to stay alert. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know when the head of the household will come, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows in the early morning or at daybreak. Don't let him show up when you weren't expecting and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all. Stay alert. This is the word of God for the people of God. Won't you pray with me? Holy God, we come before you this morning ever mindful of the ways in which you call us to be a people of hope, a people who wait on you, O oh God, who wait for your Son like the watchmen at the door. Pour out your Spirit on us gathered here, O oh God. And as your word is proclaimed, we will hear your call. We will stay awake. We will leave this place ever waiting on you. 
And as always, God, I pray that you will use me in spite of me, that my words will not be a hindrance to your word, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This week we begin a new sermon series based on the Revised Common Lectionary. Pastor Tim and I will be doing this sermon series together as we journey through this season of anticipation and as we look for Christ. Each week we will enter into the gospel lesson for a new lesson that will help us prepare the way of the Lord. This week we turn to the 13th chapter of the gospel of Mark. Here Jesus is talking to the disciples about an apocalyptic return after what will come later in the week or the end of the world as we know it. But before we can discuss this end of the world, we must first back up to the beginning of Jesus' final week here on earth. Just before that week, Jesus storms into the temple. We find Jesus so upset at the corrupt practices that are going on that he turns tables in a fit of rage against the religious establishment. In the aftermath of this scene, Jesus then begins to interact with the leaders of the temple, answering their various questions of Jesus. But you see, in this interrogation, Jesus begins to take a different approach than what has seen in other parts of the gospel. Jesus does not stand up and quiet people telling them, my time has not come yet. Jesus does not stand up and say, you know what's going on. No, in this moment, Jesus aims to be noticed. Jesus is pushing the envelope. And Jesus is driving his point home, as some theologians call it, the prophetic challenge against a corrupt temple system that is failing to be a sacred and safe house of prayer for all nations. So after pushing this envelope, after arguing with the temple leaders, after driving home that the temple is no longer what it's supposed to be, Jesus walks outside and begins to talk to the disciples about all he has said to the temple leaders. And as this conversation goes on, he begins to talk about the destruction of the very temple that they were just standing in. And after hearing Jesus' prediction of the destruction, his closest disciples, Peter, John, and James, begin to ask him in a private place, about when these things will come to pass. And here Jesus begins telling his disciples of the apocalyptic, catastrophic, destructive ending of the world. And we find ourselves this morning in the second half of this conversation as Jesus tells of further destruction and turmoil that is to come. Now for us, Advent has historically been a time of preparation. We begin to prepare for Christmas. We look forward to singing Christmas carols, wrapping presents, gathering on Christmas Eve and lighting carols as we sing Silent Night. We look forward to the happy and exciting season that can be Advent. We seem to relish all the things that bring us joy during this season. So it can be quite odd that this scripture reading accompanies us on the first week of our journey. It seems odd that at a time when we should be getting excited about what is to come, we are caught up in this difficult apocalyptic text warning us about what is to come. And yet, this also seems like the season that we find ourselves in. We're in a world full of social distancing. We're in a world where we have to wear face masks and we can't see each other's smiles. We have just come off a week where many may not have quite had the Thanksgiving that they were hoping for. They were not able to gather with all of their families in person. We come to this place and this space from communities where cases of COVID-19 are on the rise. We perhaps come to this place unsure if we will be able to see our families at Christmas. 
perhaps in this strange season of life, we find this text somewhat relatable. Perhaps instead of reading, but in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. We read in those days after the virus, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And somewhere in this passage of scripture, somewhere in this dark passage about the end times, somewhere in this beginning stages of our journey together, this Advent season, somehow, somewhere, we are to gain hope. This morning, just a few moments ago, we gathered together and Glenn and Ruth lit this candle of hope. We acknowledged that this is an advent unlike any other. And as we begin this journey toward Bethlehem, we look for hope. And in the midst of all that we've been through this year, in the midst of increasing restrictions, in the midst of a confusing passage of scripture about the end of the world, it can seem far, far removed from any glimmer of hope. And despite these feelings, this journey that we are all on together pushes us to look for hope, even in the midst of our present darkness, and even in the midst of a confusing gospel message. You see, we gain hope this morning in what Jesus brings to us. In our passage this morning, Jesus reminds us that a total collapse is coming. It's a collapse of the moral, spiritual, social, and political order of things. A precipitous, dystopian descent into the abyss. Perhaps put more simply, it's a lights out for the universe. And yet, for us this morning, this very thing, this destruction of all that is, this is a word of good news. You see, we live in a fallen world. In this fallen world, the powers and principalities reign free. They want us to believe that they are the ones in control. They try to reward us, to persuade us to stay on their side. And when that doesn't work, the powers, the principalities, the forces at work in this world, if they can't bribe us, they will hold us to the ultimate power. Death. You see, the powers and principalities want us to fear death. And yet we know Christ has defeated this power. Christ has overcome the power of death in his resurrection. And in knowing who Christ is, in accepting him as our Lord and Savior, in choosing to become more and more like him, we too can defeat the power of death. And when Christ returns... When Christ comes again, he will bring about his kingdom here on earth. This moral, spiritual, social, and political order that we find ourselves living in the here and now, this order of powers and principalities, it will be no more. So we find hope that our journey is not just to the manger, but it's beyond. We find hope in waiting for Christ to return again. And when Christ returns, this kingdom will be restored to its original intent. To the good state that it was when God created in Genesis. Many people have wondered in our scripture lesson this morning. They wonder and perhaps we too wonder when will all of this take place? That seems to be the next logical question. But Christ, even in our text today, gives us hints as to when it will happen. Or so we think. At the beginning of the passage, we're given this hint about the sun and the moon being darkened, about stars falling from heaven. And we are told that, we, that then we will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. You know, it's obvious that obviously Christ did not come and destroy the kingdom of Rome. It's obvious that we have not seen Christ return so far in our lifetime. And yet at times it seems like we are living in these very end times. It seems like the sun and the moon are darkened. 
And yet our text today reminds us that even when we feel like the psalmist, even when we cry out, how long, O Lord, we are unable to answer that question of when. In our text today, Jesus reminds us about that day or hour no one knows. Neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And so in the midst of our finding hope in Christ's coming again, we must wait. Our waiting for Christ unites us with those who waited in that very first advent all those years ago. You see, the Jews were waiting for a Messiah. They waited for the one who would come and set them free. They waited for the one who would come and deliver them from the captivity they found themselves in. And they waited, and they waited, and they waited. And much like those who waited for Christ to be born in the manger, for those who journey to the manger, we find ourselves waiting. We wait with eager anticipation for Christ to return. We find that now, perhaps more than ever, this journey, this advent, doesn't stop at the manger. In fact, we find that our journey goes way beyond the manger as we are waiting and waiting and waiting. We can't and won't know the day or hour, so we wait. And we wait. And we wait. But then what do we do? Where does our journey take us in the meantime? What do we do to prepare for this journey to Bethlehem and beyond this Advent season? For the answer to this question, we turn to the final parable in our gospel lesson this morning. Jesus offers this parable of a man, the head of a household, going on a journey, leaving servants in charge while he is away. You see, we are the servants. God has entrusted us with a part of God's kingdom-building work here at Mount Olivet. And as we wait for the master to return, we have work to do. We are called to keep awake. Now, our call to stay awake could be a long one. We will never know when Christ will return. It could be in the next few minutes, or it could be years and years away. So in the meantime, we are called to the slow work of keeping up God's kingdom-building work in the meantime. Sometimes in the midst of all that goes on, in the midst of the storms of life, it can seem like meaningless work. But I promise you it's not. Pastor and theologian Eugene Peterson once described this work, this long, slow work of building about God's kingdom as we wait, as similar to the work of a glacier. Peterson writes, The advance of a glacier is a slow process, moving on average less than one meter per day. But the glacier's movement crushes and redistributes rocks, carving out canyons, making way for rivers, moving the earth in extraordinary ways. Staying true to God's way may not move mountains in a quick moment, but in God's time, it reshapes the world in the church's wake. You see, we have a responsibility for the little portion of God's kingdom that God has given us to work in. Our work might take time. It might not be fully realized in our own lifetime. It may not even pay off until Christ returns. But it is the work that we are called to do as we keep awake. The work of keeping awake, of tending this part of God's kingdom, looks differently at different times. It manifests in mission work, in caring for our neighbors, in welcoming the stranger. But it is our work. It is persistent work. It is the work of a glacier, but it is a work that makes a difference too. This Advent, we will be on this journey together. Yes, we will anticipate Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, born in the manger. But much as those at the first Advent watched and waited for the Messiah, we watch and wait for our Messiah to return. 
Our hope is in his return. Our hope is in the destruction of the powers and principalities of this world and their world order. And in the meantime, we work. We stay awake. We do the slow, steady work of building God's kingdom, even in the here and now. We watch. We wait. We stay awake through the work, and we hope. We journey to Bethlehem and beyond. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue in worship, we do so through responding to God's call. As we gather together this Advent season, as we prepare our hearts for the King of Kings, both in the manger and beyond, one of the ways we do that work is through confessing our faith. This Advent season, we're going to be using an Advent confession of faith. This confession is new to many of us, but I invite you to join with me with the words on the screen or in your bulletin as we confess our faith using the Advent Confession of Faith. Won't you join with me? We believe in God, robed in splendor, veiled in mystery, ruler alike of darkness and light. We encounter God in Jesus Christ, who was tested and put to death, but whose radiance could not be quenched whose torch brings a blaze of color to a dull, dreary world, reviving the weary, healing the wounded, unsettling the satisfied. We walk with God, guided by the light of God's loving spirit, the light which enters the shadowed places of our hearts and leads us into truth and life. We wait for God, and for the fulfillment of God's promises, for the time when the darkness will hold no fear and the light will show the way, and creation will be made whole once more, and God's peace will reign forever. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we respond by contributing a portion of all that God has given us for God's kingdom building work, for that slow, steady work of a glacier, for that caring for all God puts in our path. We give thanks for all of you who have continued to support the church. We invite you to give your gifts, tithes, and offerings in three ways. One, there are offering plates in the back. We invite you to use those as you leave the sanctuary. Simply place those in. Those of you worshiping with us online, you can mail in your tithes or use PayPal. If you're gathered in the sanctuary, there's a QR code on the back of your bulletin. You can simply scan that code and it will direct you how to give online using PayPal. I invite you to join with me as we pray over these gifts, tithes, <laughs> and offerings. The words in the bulletin are the correct words. Won't you join with me as we lift up our voices in prayer? Faithful God, we thank you that Christ is being revealed in every time and place until he comes again in the fullness of glory. Strengthen our testimony in spiritual gifts. Increase generosity in us. We pray as we wait for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, that is the work that we are called to do this Advent season. In the midst of all that is going on in our lives, in the midst of all that is going on in this world, we are to wait faithfully for the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. But that waiting is not a passive waiting. That's why Jesus says, keep awake. Because we are called to go forth and to do God's work, to do God's kingdom building work, so that one day when Christ returns, all that we have done will show Christ's witness. And that the order of the world we live in will be no more. And God's eternal kingdom 
shall be established here on earth. That is our hope, and that is what we wait for. Go forth from this place, empowered by God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to wait, but to do it actively. Amen.